uh, also that uh, Tampa has been uh, my home in the struggle for civil liberties for at least 15 years. Some of you will remember that the struggle uh, against secret evidence to be used to deport people uh, centered on the struggle uh, of deportation for uh, Mazen al uh, beginning in 1997 when Bill Clinton's administration passed the Secret Evidence uh, Act uh, after the bombing of the Oklahoma City Courthouse carried out <coughs> by a terrorist. And of course, we know who terrorists are. They're guys from Buffalo <coughs> with short haircuts who are former members of the U.S. Army. <laughs> <coughs> and there's a point to be made with that because we use the word terrorist and everybody uses the word terrorist without having a clear idea what we mean when we use that word. And it's a perfect word because we don't have a uh, definition for exactly what it is. I'm going to use a few examples uh, of the use and misuse of language and of American history to put our current situation into perspective. The first is a quote that I'm hoping that we'll remember. It's on my door of my office. Of course, the people don't want war, but it's not up to them. It's up to the leaders. And the people can always be brought to the bidding of the leaders. First, you have to tell them they're under threat. Then you have to accuse the pacifists of being disloyal and putting the nation at risk. And then you can do whatever you want. It's always been that way. The author, Herman Gorin, at the Nuremberg War Crimes Tribunals in 1946. He borrowed, of course, from Matthew Valley and the Prince. It's a clever use of power. It always has been used by the powerful in order for the powerful to exercise more powerful by creating the illusion of threat in order to cow the populace, to allow the powerful to do more and to do what they will. It also is found uh, in a very delightful form in George Orwell's 1984, in which the enemy constantly changes uh, and Big Brother explains who the new enemy is uh, with each uh, turn of the uh, historical circumstance. The wonderful thing about uh, terrorism as opposed to communism is that there is no there there with, time, with terrorism and it can be whoever the <laughs> leaders need the enemy to be from time to time. It's a perfect enemy in that respect. Now, the uh, having an enemy uh, is an important concept if one is going to generate power uh, and to maintain power. And this isn't a new concept. It's not something that I've invented. Um, but it is a concept that, uh, that those who exercise power have understood for a long time. Now, in uh, the uh, uh, arc of American history, uh, this notion of identifying an enemy as a way to uh, exercise power um, has had a countertrend. And that countertrend has been respect for legal limits on the exercise of power, a notion that dem democracy and power from the bottom is the really legitimate exercise of power, that the notion that uh, power from the top needs to be limited by constitutional and legal exercise of power uh, from below uh, has been a um, uh, counter trend that's reflected in another quote that I'd like you to think about, which comes from Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass, of course, was a slave, uh, educated himself, uh, freed himself, uh, and he was a contemporary of Lincoln's, and he gives us the counter trend to uh, Goring's notion of the exercise of power. 
Uh, he said that power concedes nothing without demand. It never has, and it never will. Those who want freedom and justice without struggle against power are like those who want the crops to grow without the rain. And the coin of the realm for those without power who wish to contest the method of exercise of power suggested by Gori are those like us who will not accept the Koch brothers dictating to the governor of Wisconsin how it is that unions will be treated in Wisconsin, find their power in what the people of Wisconsin are doing in the State House of Wisconsin today. And what the people of Egypt have done in Tiger Square. And what the people in Yemen and the people in Libya and what the people around the world who have questioned power in their hundreds, in their thousands, in their millions have done repeatedly, which actually has been the source of our democracy as well. Now, the reason that I suggest that this notion uh, that uh, power and the exercise of power uh, is at the heart of what we're talking about today in our wake up call is something that I think we um, are witnessing uh, before our eyes. There's an old story in American history, if one looks at it closely of identifying a group that can be marginalized, that can be treated specially, that can be targeted by the law for special treatment because they're not well understood, because they're unpopular, because they could be marginalized. Um, there was a time when abolitionists could be attacked and marginalized that way. John Brown was a terrorist who attacked a military facility in Martin's Ferry. Uh, to liberate guns, to be able to, he thought, start a rebellion to free the slaves. He was a terrorist at this time. He was executed before the Civil War. Some people today think of him as a liberator. There was a period of time when people who were opposed to uh, uh, the government were called seditious or anarchists. Uh, in my own city of Chicago, where I was born, uh, the struggle for an eight-hour day uh, began with the Haymarket Square Massacre, where people who were, were organizers for unions were killed. Uh, uh, and then uh, there was a huge massacre. Uh, people were assassinated and people were hung with the idea that they were terrorists in their day. Uh, eventually, there was a labor movement. Uh, in the early part of the 20th century, uh, we've all heard stories about communists and being singled out. And this relates back to why I came to Tampa in the first place in 1997. Because it wasn't until uh, actually the early 1990s when it was possible uh, to finally be a communist and to be able to get a visa to enter the United States. It took that long for the McCarthy era to be put behind us in the sense that that label uh, did not uh, exclude a person from being able to enter the United States as a normal person. But a new thing happened, and I began writing articles uh, at that time that uh, caused Sammy and I to get together because I started explaining that terrorism, as defined in the Anti-Terrorism Death Penalty Act of 1997, was about to become the new communism because it was the perfect foil to create a new national security state because it was an enemy that could be found anywhere because no one knew what a terrorist was. <coughs> this last summer, uh, quite apart from the other uh, wonderful things that you, you said about me that qualified me to be here, is I live in Minnesota. Uh, we have a, another speaker here, Jess Sunday, who I've known for a long time in the anti-war movement in Minnesota. And she is particularly um, uh, qualified to be here because her house was raided by the FBI. 
because she's an anti-war activist and she supports the Palestinian movement and she's uh, campaigned for uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, organizations that oppose U.S. Uh, militarism and occupation in Colombia. So she's been defined as a as being engaged in material support for terrorism. Um, but in Minnesota, this is something that's been going on for 10 years in the Somali community. First, they closed all the Hawalas in 2001. Not one prosecution from closing all of the Hawalas. Not one. Was there an apology? Did, was there an announcement that there were no crimes? Found from closing all the Hawalas? No. What's Hawala? Hawala is a money transfer service that is uh, worked out in, in the uh, Muslim community. They transfer money uh, overseas. Oh, sorry. 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 It, it's, a, it's a money transfer system uh, in the Muslim world. Okay, thank you. Okay. And, and the idea was that, that these uh, money transfer services were somehow supporting terrorism around the world. So they closed them all, searched people's homes, uh, uh, went through all of this uh, and, and demonized the Somali community. Not one criminal charge, not one apology, not one public admission, admission they found out. Then in 2006, Ethiopia invaded Somalia. Ethiopia, a Christian country, uh, U.S. Air Force supported the invasion and has been openly supporting uh, Ethiopia since that time. Somali guys from around the world went back to fight in the homeland the way that Irish guys would if Britain invaded Ireland again, or if Egypt had invaded Israel, um, where would all the young Israeli guys be, you know, Jewish guys be? That's what happened in Minnesota. And since 2006, Minnesota has been the site of the largest and most expensive anti-terrorism investigation in history. Did you know that? In the Midwest, a state of 5 million people that has 100,000 Somalis is the center of international jihad according to the FBI and the Justice Department, on the record, and has been for the last six years. And the result of the largest and most expensive investigation uh, in history has been roughly 15 pleas of guilty. Half of them have been material support for terrorism. My body was in Somalia. My body is physical. It's material. The other half were, I knew those guys were going to Somalia, but I didn't tell you. So I lied to a federal official. Last summer, the law changed again. The international uh, uh, the uh, Humanitarian Law Project versus Holder case was decided by the Supreme Court. Elena Kagan, who's now in the Supreme Court, was asked the question, do you mean that if a lawyer is representing an organization that's been put on the forbidden list by the uh, Secretary of State, and that lawyer argues in front of the United Nations <coughs> on behalf of this organization that they want the help of the United Nations <coughs> in doing legal things and becoming nonviolent, that that would be material support for terrorism according to the uh, Obama administration. Elena Kagan said yes. What has happened is just before Jess Sundin's house and the other Minnesota activists were raided, the Supreme Court changed the law to eliminate the requirement that activists have any intention of supporting illegal acts of organizations that the Secretary of State has deemed illegal to associate with. At the same time, their, house, their houses were raided in the Somali community. The two women that I've been advising who collect old clothes and send them to the refugee camps in Kenya, because that's their zakat, they were indicted for material support <coughs> There's no defense. The old clothes are material. They were sending them to a refugee camp. At that refugee camp, it could be that members of Al Shabaab will get to wear the Mickey Mouse t-shirts and the old uh, <laughs> There's no defense. 
And if you send a Mickey Mouse t-shirt that could get in the hands of the terrorist, you'll go to prison too. And the point is, up until now, uh, and up until the house of the activists were searched, and the houses of the activists in Chicago were searched, uh, those of us who were not Muslim thought that this was a Muslim issue. In Minnesota, we thought it was a Somali issue. No, what's happened is the laws of the United States have changed in ways that are too numerous to detail here. The notion now is that there is such a threat to the United States security, domestically and internationally, that the security of the United States is under such threat <coughs> that it's necessary to send CIA agents into Pakistan, calling them consular officials, so that they have immunity when they kill Pakistanis on the street. We're under such threat that it's perfectly okay for the FBI to uh, organize crimes in Portland, uh, Oregon, and then to get unwilling and unknow unknowing uh, young men to get involved with an FBI crime, and then the FBI is successful in discovering their own crime. And it's perfectly okay to send uh, people to uh, observe meetings like this, because there is a federal agent taking notes on what's going on here today. Because, you see, terrorism is everywhere. And if you talk to the public at large, the notion is that we are under such threat internationally and domestically that the gloves have had to come off and national security requires doing anything that's necessary to protect this, the most powerful nation the world has ever seen, by reducing the civil liberties that this nation has had that's made it possible for democracy to get this far. I would suggest to you that we're entering a period in our history in which the future will be determined by political activism like what we're seeing in Wisconsin, Indiana, Ohio. And it's not going to be a struggle just to defend the civil liberties of Muslim people, but Muslim people and the struggle of Muslim people and the targeting of Muslim people shows the rest of us what's in store for the rest of us because, as Frederick Douglass has said, and those of you who have heard me speak before know that I repeat this, because he was right in the 1760s when he said this, and he is right today. Power concedes nothing without demand. It doesn't in Wisconsin. It doesn't in Indiana. It doesn't in Ohio. It doesn't in Washington, D.C. It doesn't in Tampa, it doesn't in Cairo, it doesn't in Libya. It never has, and it never will. And those who want justice and freedom without struggle are those who want the crops to grow without the rain. It will not happen without our struggle in order to turn back this wave of the change in fundamental laws that are making civil liberties more difficult to exercise and make it impossible for people like Jeff Sundin to be political activists to oppose U.S. policy. And let me just show you one thing to make this concrete. This is what the Supreme Court has upheld as being the definition of a terrorist organization. The Secretary of State may designate a foreign organization only, uh, as a terrorist organization, only if she finds that it threatens the security of the United States nationals or the national security of the United States, irrespective of what its tactics are. 
That means that the only way an organization can be a terrorist organization is if the Secretary of State thinks that its policies are contrary to U.S. policies. By definition, an organization that supports U.S. policy, no matter what it's doing, cannot be a terrorist organization, cannot be on the list. Do we understand clearly what that means? Two organizations fighting each other with the same tactics. One that the Secretary of State thinks is using those tactics in support of U.S. policy, U.S. security, and one that's against U.S. security, according to today's Secretary of State. Only one can be terrorist. Not because of what they're doing but because of the Secretary of State's impression <coughs> of that organization's support for U.S. national security. It's the Secretary of State's political <coughs> opinion of the organization, not <coughs> what they do, that makes them terrorist or not. And tomorrow, the Secretary of State can decide there's a change in policy, respect to U.S. national security, the list changes. There can be election and U.S. policy changes, they can change again. Returning to 1984, if you remember the book, what happened was every day the population would get up, go look at the big screen, and find out who the enemy was today. The next day, there would be another enemy, and the yesterday's enemy was now the Allies. The U.S. Supreme Court, just this last summer, committed to law and upheld the Big Brother version of who the enemy will be. So, um, we have a lot of work to do, and today we're going to talk about the wake-up call and the need to do what our forebears in the United States have always done that has gotten us this far, and we can draw inspiration from what the people are doing around the world and the people are doing uh, in the northern states, and I know the people in Florida are not going to be far behind because we've got a struggle to do here, too. Thank you.